Hey everybody, welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I'm your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. the Bod Father. I have an amazing interview for you guys this evening. I have from the iconic band, death metal band, of course, DE side, Mr. Steve Ashim. Steve, how's it going, brother? It's going good, brother. How you doing out there? Doing pretty good, doing pretty good. You guys have a new CD that's coming out November the 25th. It's called In the Minds of Evil. Let's talk about this because I've heard it's gone back to the old school way. So what's your take on it? Yeah, it's uh, going back to the old school way. That was kind of uh, that was kind of the point as we were going into it, is to write riffs that were kind of old schooly and chucky and chunky and whatnot. And uh, so we kind of concentrated on that. But when we put the drums to it, that's kind of we just went nuts on that. So so it ain't that old school. The riffs sound old school, but the arrangements are new, and it's just it's just downright brutal uh, delivery of a record there, man. I hope you guys all dig it. You know, I've said this before, and I'll say it again to friends I've been talking to about your all's music. It's so in your face, and it grabs your attention, and if you don't like it, then there's something wrong with you, what I've always said. <laughs> you know, I've always felt that way myself. There's something wrong with some people out there. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true you guys have been around since 1987 and i mean you guys have seen things change with the with the music and everything but being a death metal band coming out in the 80s how was it for you guys was it hard did you guys get a lot of fans at the at, when you first started how was it back then you know it was real interesting to watch a band grow from the ground up like that but i'll tell you we put out uh, we, we did that first demo in 87 and it was like we didn't feel all that confident. It sounded great, so we never released it to anyone. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until uh, '88 we started doing um, like doing concerts around, and like just bootleg tapes would start trading around. Right. And uh, you know, we never really had all that much trouble like getting fans behind us. Like we opened up a PO box, or we had some kind of address somewhere. Maybe it was Glen's house, and we were getting mail from overseas and every South America from all over. By 88, people were sending drugs and, like, chicks were giving us pap smears and, and like, <laughs> like smeared blood paper in the mail. <laughs> Crazy what people will do out there. But, yes, we, we were, we were kind of collecting fans early on from when people just first started hearing about us. Or if they'd even heard any of our music yet, uh, it's hard to tell, but we were, we, were, uh, we were gaining fans pretty fast, even early on. You know, it's hard to explain. It's amazing on what fans will go to that extra mile to reach out to their, their favorite bands and stuff. It, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> but, you know, they're just giving it back. I mean, we're giving them crazy music because we're crazy, and they just let us know that they're crazy, too. You know? How does it make you feel, man, when you have fans that come up to you guys and say, hey, look, I've been listening to you guys since day one, and you guys have helped me out and everything. What does that mean to you as a musician? Oh, man, you know, it really means a lot. Like, personally, on, like, a personal, person-to-person -person level. Like, it's it's nice to say, oh, we like your music and we have a good time and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but when someone is like, bro, your music pulled me through this hard time, or it's like guys who were, like, in combat or in whatever, like, uh, big-time mega jocks or something, like football players or soldiers, yeah. are like, bro, before I got to go into combat, I listen to your stuff, and it blows my mind, gets me ready for what I got to do. That's inspiring to me. Makes me want to keep going and uh, provide what we provide for these people for them. Keep rolling, and um, you know, just just makes me hungrier to to keep doing what we do. Through the DSI years, Steve, what would you say your favorite album is, and some of the favorite tracks, if you have any? Oh uh, well, you know, I guess my favorites are some of the fan favorites, just because they've been around so long. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the stuff I've written is <laughs> is some of my favorites, obviously, and. Uh, uh, but I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff on the new record that could be potential future favorites, you know. It's hard to not like some of your own stuff, but there are some songs roll up on the set. I'll be like, eh, you know, I'll have no problem if we end up skipping it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but there's some, you know, there's some pretty badass songs that come pretty attached to, you know. If I if I could pull a name out of the fucking hat right now, I would. Man, it's always fun to play Dead by Dawn. People just lose their minds. Homage for Satan. That's a fun one, you know. Usually start off with that and just lay people to waste right off the bat, you know. Yeah, be done with it. Yep, there you go. See you. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> now, what, what does it mean to you, man? How how does it make you feel when you're behind your drum kit and you see all these kids and fans out there going absolutely nuts of your music on stage? How how's that? 
Oh, man, it just empowers me and energizes me, man. When I see people and we have a nice full house and people are losing their minds, it just makes me play harder and harder and fast. I try not to play faster because I don't want to throw everyone off. But I definitely put more into it and play harder. Like, I'll just pound it harder, you know? I'm sure the chicks will like to hear that. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, brother, it's totally inspiring. And when people are, are into it and rolling with it, yeah, it just makes me want to play longer and harder, brother. What got you into music, man? What what really grabbed your attention and said, that's what I want to do? Oh, man, you know what? Back in the day when I was young, and I mean like eight or nine or something, uh, some my cousin, my older cousin, had uh, Kiss Alive too. We nice. were listening to that. Yes. And I was just going through the gatefold, checking it out, and I was like, that's badass. And it wasn't until like, um, like Number of the Beast come out, and I was uh, uh, checking out the, you know, the Run to the Hills video, which blew everyone's mind back in the day. Mm. And it like kind of dawned on me that it was like, wow, you know, it's like people actually do this kind of stuff for a living. It's like, <laughs> like that's what I want to do. <laughs> I got to get in on that. So from then on, it was like I just was dead. And this is when I was 12. I already got my kid, just started dedicating myself to practicing every day. And, and you know, it was kind of, it, it, it made itself happen at that point. I was just into playing so much, there was no stopping me. Other than Kiss, Steve, who were some of your influences? Oh well, you know all the all the the, the first wave of British heavy metal they were calling it back then, Maiden and Priest and oh, Sabbath man. and Saxon and you know Saxon, uh, I liked them, but not so much an influence. They were not as hard driving as I liked. But early Venom, I remember when I first got Black the Black Metal album. They were so dirty and like grungy and not like it wasn't tight and and totally cohesive like Maiden and Priest were. Uh, but there was something more to it, you know. It was very dark and aggressive, and <laughs> the vocals were like nothing that was quite out back then. Uh, so it was like, man, let's combine the attitude of this, but the technical wizardry of that, and let's let's push forward. And then by that time, Slayer and Merciful yeah. Fate and Metallica were coming out. It's like they had taken it to the next level, give us something more to build on. And yeah, brother, I mean, it's like the cornerstones of metal are my main influence. Sabbath, Priest, Maiden, Metallica, Slayer, you know. That's my big four or I five, know, whatever. I, mean. I know that people are going to hate me for saying this, but this is a God's honest truth. I think bands back in the day appreciated the music more. They knew how to, to they had to work their asses off, which they still have to do today. But back then, bands didn't care. They didn't care to go outside the box and try something new. But today it's like, no, mainstream, you know, it's like same old, same old done. You know, you're right in a way that it's like once you've heard something a million times, and a few bands come out and they set a, a standard or a new way to go about things. Mm -hmm. Another 100 or 200 bands around the world are going to come along and emulate that. Yep. And that's cool, you know, but then you end up with 100 copies of what's already been done. And it takes a little while for someone to take that next step and push it a little bit farther in, a, in some kind of new direction, kind of make their own, you know, put their own stamp on it. And that's only natural. You know, you got to weed out the copycats until you get to a, someone who's truly inspired uh, with their own little twist on things. You know? I support so many local horror punk bands that it amazes me. I mean, these guys really put the dedication in and time into it. And, I mean, they absolutely work their asses off. And it's cool to see bands like that, especially locals, man. Do you guys get a lot of locals coming up to you guys asking for help or any advice or anything? Well, you know, we play with a lot of locals all the time. Right. I mean, every time we we do a run, and we'll take some bands on the road, uh, like nationals, even when we roll through a town, there'll be two or three or how many local acts. And sometimes we do tours where we don't even bring any nationals. We just go out with the support of nothing but local acts. Yeah. So we hear a lot of locals. We're obviously giving them a platform to play on in front of a good crowd. So I'd like to think we're always doing what we can for local acts around the world. They're busting their asses off just the same as you guys are. I mean, honestly, it takes just that one. Oh, it's even harder now because there is less chance to stand out from the crowd. With the, I mean, there's a million bands out there, and mm -hmm. uh, every one of them is pretty goddamn heavy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but you run across a couple real badass ones now and again. I will and, say uh, that's what makes it worth it. You know? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. And I will say this: there's only one DE side band, and there's only one Pantera. So get it right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, how does your all's writing process go with with the band? Does everyone contribute, or is it just you and someone else writing the music? How is it? 
Well, you know, we've got some guys in the band now that are all creative, so everyone is chipping in on the process. We've got Kevin in the band now, Kevin Carrion. We did a bunch of Order of Any Ad records together, not a bunch, two. Mm-hmm. But he was always productive as far as coming up with material, so he pitched some songs in on the record. Jacko pitched in a couple songs. I pitched in a couple songs. I think Glenn chucked in a part or two. And then we also collaborated, all of us, on a few songs. So it's a good mix of everyone getting in there. And I think I think that balance of having everyone's input on every song really rounded out the record well. It's like we were all able to bounce the ideas off each other, get the songs kind of like as cohesive as possible, kind of just stripped down to the bare, not the bare minimum, but just the absolute most powerful parts we could come on were combined. And there's like no filler parts. There's no extended versions. There's no, you know, there's no two minute outro or whatever, you know, it's just bare bones, brutal parts uh, and songs. You know, what can I fans- think that uh, that was the cool part, getting everyone in there together. You know, yeah. it really helped it round it out. You know? What can fans expect at a show from you guys? Well, man, we, uh, we put together a pretty hairy set list. It's about an hour and 15 minutes long or something. Mm-hmm. We got a ton of old school songs that people, you know, everyone's always asked, is are you going to play the old stuff? Yes. We have a ton of old stuff we play. We got a, a, a ton of new stuff we play, a ton of stuff from in between. Yeah, man. And then we just kick people's teeth down their throat from start <laughs> to finish. At least we try to. We usually succeed. That's yeah, man. It's a good time. People should definitely not miss it, especially these tours we're going to be doing here soon. We're going to have a ton of the new material on there. It's just going to be great, brothers. Come on out. That's awesome. How would you want the fans to remember you guys by? Oh, man, just being nonstop brutal for as many albums as we could muster, as many gigs as we ended up rolling out for. You know, hopefully people will forget the bad stuff, as hopefully most people do when when shit happens. You know, you try to only remember the good stuff. Hopefully yeah. that's what happens. Exactly. And, you know, being a band throughout the years, you're going to go through ups and downs, and, and stuff happens like that. That's just... You just got to get the chemistry right, and that's going to happen. Hey, man, that's life. Like with any with any endeavor or relationship, yeah, you're right, brother. Mm-hmm. Ups and downs, peaks and valleys, and strikes and gutters, brother. I <laughs> like the big Lebowski. <laughs> but yeah, it's just sticking through, man, and, uh, you know, perseverance and ambition and having a set of balls made of steel doesn't yeah. hurt. Because, you know, your best music, you think is your best music, could be, you know, thousands of people going, it sucks. But you know what? It, it's your music. So, like it or not, period. That's right. And, you know, there's always someone out there who's going to like or not like something. Oh, yeah. That's fine. That's the uh, that's the point of art. It's subjective. Yeah. So, whoever thinks it's great. Whoever's got criticism, great. You exactly. know, uh, exactly. we'll live. Exactly. We'll live through it. <laughs> now, you guys have, have paid your all's dues. But do you guys prefer the festivals, or do you prefer the club scene? Uh, you know, festivals are fun. They're giant stages and giant crowds, and it's always like this this whole festival party atmosphere, like you're at summer camp or something. <laughs> That's always cool. Uh, but they're so massive in scale, and it's kind of... It, uh, clubs are cool because it's, it's just our gig or whatever. So that has its benefits, too. Plus, um, you know, I, I'll do both, brother. It doesn't matter to me. Right. Like, just get me to the stage, and I will pound the shit out of those skins, brother. That, that's what it's all about, man. It, it, even if you play in a shoebox, let's just play. Oh, man, we we played that shoebox, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it turned out being great. We rolled up on this place in Kansas, Lawrence, Kansas, one time, the outhouse or the shit house or the brick house, whatever it was called. <laughs> and we drove past the place. It was in the middle of a cornfield, literally. I thought it was like a utility shed. It was a little block building. You know, we drove past it four or five times. Eventually, we're like, I guess that's it. <laughs> we rolled in there, and it was just a hollow building with, like, a toilet. And uh, there was there was like a tiny stage. I was like, man, there was no PA. I was like, well, this is going to be an odd one. But, man, by the time we by the time showtime came, there was 200 people in there going insane. <laughs> and uh, we just destroyed the place. It was it was amazing. Every every little shithole is going to turn into an awesome gig. You know, that's yeah. the way I look at it. It could yeah. be in someone's backyard. If you set up and they come, it's going to be a madhouse. That is insane. That is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Steve, what do you think that D side brings to music? Oh, man. Well, you know, we bring death metal to the music, man. You know, it's uh, there's a whole lot of music out there. So whatever... Whatever we can do to help fill this niche of death metal along with all the other bands out there, you know, 
we're cornering that little brutal market of the music world, you know. And what Deicide in particular brings to the death metal scene, well, it's, it's our own personal brand of death metal, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, obviously, Glenn is one of the most brutal vocalists out there. So we bring that and an unrelenting drive to stuff organized religion up your ass. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the powerful riffs and music to do it with, you know. So I think that's what we bring, from balls out to uh, intensity and an and a, and a, and a F-off attitude that people can either deal with or come talk to us about. We'll take care of it. One of my favorite bands of all time, Metallica, say, you know, you can either stay or there's the door, plain and simple. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, brother. That's what it's about is you don't compromise and you find people, you know, the people that like it will seek you out. We don't need to go seeking people out. You know what I mean? We do what we do, and like-minded people will find us. You know, that's what it's about, not catering to anyone. Just, exactly. Just everyone finding each other, kind of, you know what I mean? Exactly. Steve, man, how can people get a hold of you guys and say, we love your music, want to buy your merchandise? How can they do that? Uh, well, you know, we, uh, we've got a Facebook page, but we don't really title stuff on it. So I'd say, you know, come out to the gigs and step up to the merch booth or go to, like, maybe Century Media has a page you can buy some stuff at. Or, you know, like I say, we still got stuff on Roadrunner and on Earache. Go to their pages, buy some of that stuff. But definitely uh, don't forget to buy the new record. It's going to blow your ass away. Yeah, and that comes out November the 25th, everybody, and it's called In the Minds of Evil. Check them out. Hey, man, DSI's been around for a long time. Great music. Just give them a chance. You'll like it. Hey, if not, it'll 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 uh, bump you up to do something cool. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Steve, man, before I let you go, will you care to do a promo for my show if that's cool? Yeah, of course, brother. This is Steve Ashim, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour, so turn that up. Thank you, man. I appreciate it, and uh, wish y'all the best of luck, and, you know, rock out for us, brother. Hey, John, you know I keep, we'll, uh, we'll keep on keeping on, brother, and you too. You're always welcome back on this show, my friend. I appreciate it, brother. You uh, you may just see me on there again here soon. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, keep it up, brother. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Me too. Thanks. Stick around. We got some music coming up for you metalheads out there. That was Steve Ashim from the East Side. Great band. Please check them out. You know, just give them a chance. Thanks. Have a great evening, guys, and just enjoy the show. <laughs> 